Hi, everyone. Um, this is uh, the dermatologist. And um, I want to introduce uh, first uh, Dr. Julia Siegel. Maybe you want to say something about yourself? Sure. So I'm a dermatologist at Boston Dermatology and Laser Center, which is right near the Herscott Center here near MGH. And I've been here for a year. Um, it's been a great experience so far. And I've really enjoyed meeting all the patients here and working with Dr. Gravelink. Um, and I'm very excited to be working with patients with tuberous sclerosis going forward. And Dr. Gravelink has given me a great introduction to that population. And I look forward to meeting all of you. Yeah, so um, my name is Yoke Gravelink and I have been um at the MGH now uh, 36 years and uh, was fortunate enough to be in, uh, getting involved with the uh, TSC population early on in uh, my career. And uh, when the TSC center was established by the Herscott family uh, and, uh, and, and spearheaded by Dr. Elizabeth Thiel, um, you know, we were, we were asked to provide dermatologic care. And at the time we were very, um, uh, involved with lasers uh, was sort of my specialty, and we uh, found ways to use lasers uh, uh, to treat skin conditions in um, in tuberous sclerosis, and uh, that has been uh, quite successful for a number of the conditions that we see. Um, and in addition to that, as a comprehensive center, uh, we've been participating in the research, uh, especially uh, uh, genetics research that has been going on at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital as well. So we really love to work with other providers and with patients and their families as a team to treat this condition and understand this condition. So patients are obviously the most important. This is patient-centered care that's really important to us. And oftentimes we are seeing younger patients or patients that do need the help of their parents. And so the parents are a big part of the team as well. And we like everyone to feel comfortable and listened to and included in treatment plans. Um, we're also very fortunate to have the TSC Alliance which is a wonderful group that has a great website with a lot of information about all of the different components of tuberous sclerosis. Um, and then, you know, medical professionals, we work with a lot of other specialties. You're hearing from a lot of these other specialists today. So it's a privilege to be able to be part of this multidisciplinary team. Um, and similarly, these specific clinics that include various providers of different specialties. And Dr. Grevelink has just spoken about the research component as well, which is very important as we're constantly looking for new treatments and new ways um, to help, you know, to help our patients with tuberous sclerosis. So, so let's talk a little bit about the skin conditions uh, that we commonly see in, in tuberous sclerosis patients, but, uh, we also see a lot of skin diseases also common to the general population. And uh, those have to be addressed as well at the same time. So uh, comprehensive dermatologic care for TSC patients is uh, really very important. So there's a number of findings that a lot of you are probably familiar with, a number of findings in the skin. Um, we will go through each one of these and show some photographs and then also talk about treatment options and show some before and afters. There's facial angiofibromas, um, fibrous plaques of the face. The fibrous plaque is often one of the earlier signs. Periungal fibromas, which are growths around the nails. Chagrin patches, which are often on the back. Um, ash leaf macules, which are lighter spots that are also a very early sign of tuberous sclerosis. Cafe au lait macules are darker patches that again are an early sign and confetti macules on the leg. So we'll go through each one of these, but this diagram is just a little summary slide. So one of the more common signs that we see in, in uh, tuberous sclerosis are the angiofibromas, which actually are a little bit of a misnomer. Um, there is somewhat of a vascular component to these, but they're mainly fibromas. Uh, just like we see fibromas in other organs um, in tuberous sclerosis, uh, they are also seen in the skin. And um, we have now laser treatments that we can use and other methods that we can use in dermatology to smooth these out 
and make these lesions much less visible. Um, the lesions typically grow, uh, and I found this anecdotally over the years, that the, the, the real growth phase typically is between ages 5 and 21. Uh, so uh, if one treats too early with these lesions, it's difficult to really get a permanent result. If we can wait a little longer to treat these, then the, the, the interval between retreatments is typically a lot longer uh, as they later on in life, they grow less, uh, much less uh, pronounced and, and, and slower. Uh, this is where also newer treatments come in, uh, such as um, the uh, sirolimus cream and the newer creams that are coming out and that are being uh, studied right now to minimize the growth of these uh, fibromas uh, that are uh, often bothersome because they bleed, because they grow, or because they have otherwise symptomatic or just cosmetically very displeasing. So early treatment, you know, will help to prevent social stigma, obviously. And, uh, earlier in life, they look like acne lesions, but then uh, as one gets older, they, they look like fibromas and uh, uh, they, they often will need to be addressed. So repeated treatments, unfortunately, will often be necessary, but most treatments can be done in the office now. Uh, we can do certainly small segments in most patients, even patients with developmental delays, uh, very satisfactorily in the office without having to uh, resort to general anesthesia. Uh, the downtime for healing depends on the laser that we use, but typically is about seven to 10 days, which is amazingly well tolerated by most patients. And um, uh, like I said, general anesthesia is sometimes needed to allow proper treatment if we have very large areas. Uh, and we do that at Mass General Hospital. So here you can see um, some of the patients with angiofibromas. This is before any treatments were done. And you can see some of them are larger, um, could be bothersome, you know, especially if someone's feeling them on their face and constantly rubbing them or picking at them, even if they're not bleeding on their own, they would be bothersome. And here you can see, here's Dr. Graveling um, with him post-op uh, right after and then seven days out. It's an amazing improvement. Yeah, we follow these people along and you can see before and afters. And even though we don't get perfect skin, we see very marked improvement. And uh, it makes a huge difference for most patients. And this is done with the resurfacing laser. In this case, it was the ultra-pulse carbon dioxide laser. Uh, in the office now, we use the contour laser very satisfactorily. and. Uh, uh, like I said, the results are, are quite long lasting, but uh, occasional touch up will be necessary. This is another patient as well, where you can see the improvement six months later after the treatment. And again, here you can see the improvement. So Dr. Graveling started to talk a little bit about topical rapamycin or serolimus. Those are um, both the same name. Those are different names for the same compound. And this can be used to treat the facial angiofibromas um, and even, you know, really thin fibrous plaques as well, depending on how early you start with it. But um, there's definitely a role for this topical treatment in addition to the resurfacing and the physical destruction. So briefly, I talked already about this uh, defined growth phase that is pronounced between ages five and 20, but we can see growth later on in life as well, but not as pronounced. Um, the vascular lesions have been used with uh, limited success. Uh, uh, and so the resurfacing lesions are preferred to start with. Uh, later on in the course of treatment, one can use a vascular laser with some result. Um, so if one has very nodular or papular lesions, like you've seen in some of these patients, the, the, topical, uh, the topical treatments are really not very useful. Um, and we mentioned the gen genetics research before as well. And I think I really, really appreciate the participation of all the parents and the patients and everyone involved in tuberculosis to make this happen. And we've, we've 
we're hoping that you will all be still be participating in in the research uh, to, uh, to to bring an end to this uh, to this disease. So here's a few of the other findings that we briefly talked about. This is the fibrous plaque of the face. Um, and again, this is one of the earlier findings. We show it here on two different skin types. So you can see sometimes it's lighter, sometimes it's darker. And this can be resurfaced with the laser as well um, in a similar way that we treat the angiofibromas. And the periungual fibromas, these are really bothersome to patients as well because their growth sticking out right by the nail. So people can feel discomfort when they're walking, if they're on the toes or, you know, we're using our hands in everyday life. So to have something sticking out of the nail or near the nail is really uncomfortable and bothersome for people. Um, we have a lot of great modalities of treating these um, different destruction techniques to get rid of them. And they're really safe and well-tolerated. People do really well. We'll show you a few before and afters of these. So this is just local destruction. You can see on the thumb here, it was really sticking out of the thumbnail and distorting the nail here. Um, and then here after the treatment, it, you know, the nail's not perfect, of course, but the big fibroma that was growing is now gone and flattened and a lot more tolerable, not getting caught on things, stuck on clothing. Um, the nail is able to be trimmed back better once this is gone as well. And this can also be treated with laser, with the carbon dioxide laser or with the Erbium YAG resurfacing contour laser that Dr. Gremlink mentioned. Um, so you can see here a big improvement. So here is a, an example of a shagreen patch and you can see in different skin types, darker skin types, skin phototypes, uh, you see different you know, expressions of this. Um, these are typically asymptomatic. They're located on the lower back or the mid back and they give sort of a cobblestone sort of appearance here on the back of these plaques. They're asymptomatic and so we typically do not treat these. And we talked briefly about the ash leaf macules. Again, these are asymptomatic. They're not bothersome to people. Um, so these don't require treatment either. Um, they're called ash leaf because sometimes they do come to a little bit of a point here and they're broader at the base, which is you know supposed to mimic a certain tree, um, a tree leaf. But uh, these are asymptomatic and we can just sort of let them be. Sometimes people in the general population do have hypopigmented spots like this as well. So just seeing one of these is not cause for concern for tuberous sclerosis, but this is one of the findings. And, and sort of the, the, the opposite here, we also have other, you know, hyperpigmentation, so darker areas that we can see in tuberous sclerosis more commonly, and it can also be seen in other conditions, but in tuberous sclerosis, definitely a higher incidence of these uh, hyperpigmented areas. They, those can be treated with pigment lasers, but typically off the face, we would not bother and just leave them alone and, and call them a beautiful uh, thing to look at, really. And lastly, confetti macules have been described in tuberous sclerosis. So these are just tiny little white flat spots, usually on the lower legs, don't need any treatment. Um, but if you did see this on someone with tuberous sclerosis, you wouldn't be concerned. This is just a normal finding and part of the complex. So here we are um, looking at a number of conditions that we see in, in, in the general population and, and, and all age groups. Um, so um, we need to provide care for that as well. And, and, um, and that is, uh, you know, our, our, what you call bread and butter dermatology. Um, but it's uh, super important for, for all the patients and the, and the families to have that taken care of as well. And any questions that you may have, we are happy to help you with at Boston Dermatology and Laser Center. Um, again, we are close by to the Herscott Center and we, um, we really are patient-centered and we like to be able to get people in right away whenever a new concern comes up. So you can always reach out to us and 
um, we can be flexible to make everything work for you. We have our website listed down here and our phone number, but um, you can also ask for our contact information uh, at the end of this conference as well. We'll we're happy to give that out. Thank you. It's been such a privilege and pleasure taking care of uh, two osclerosis patients and the families and to interact with all the specialists and and have the real team approach uh, to uh, to address this uh, to address this condition and, and disease. And I've met several of you, but I'm really looking forward to working with all of you going forward. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Bye bye. Bye.